My dear respected Muslim brothers and non-Muslim guests, I'm very grateful to be here tonight and I'm feeling very honored to have this opportunity to address you on this critical topic. And I want to make sure that you understand that this is not really a lecture. I'm not prepared to lecture on this particular topic as if I have some special credentials to speak about the purpose of life. Actually, it's a sort of advice, an advice even to myself. Because I can see myself sitting where you're sitting. A few years ago, it seems almost like a few days ago, a non-Muslim, in particular, a Christian, a human being, the ethnicity or the nationality, it doesn't really matter. But an individual, a person who at that particular time did not know exactly, could not answer for myself, what is the purpose of life? Now I realize that in order for me to deliver this information to you, it will take some of your precious critical time. And no one has even a minute of life to waste. So with that note, I would request you, all of you, to think of what I'm saying to you as information and advice. Now this information may seem to be somewhat extensive. But when you consider the capacity of the human brain, the amount of information that it can store, the amount of information that it is able to process, and decipher, then I don't think that the information that I'm going to share with you tonight will necessarily overburden you. Now, it is my responsibility to address the topic, what is the purpose of our life, and also to ask you the question, what do you know about Islam? I mean, what do you really know about Islam? Not what you read in the newspapers, not what you saw on television that was prepared for you, not the preconditioned information that came from people who had their own prejudices and their own limited views. But what do you really know about Islam? What facts do you really have about Islam and Muslims? Not necessarily even what have you seen in the action of some Muslims whom you may know. For that may not be an accurate reference either. As I mentioned, I am extremely honored to have this opportunity to be here in Sydney, Australia, in the land down under, if that's what you call it. And I would like to begin by saying that all of you have an equal responsibility with myself. And the responsibility that you have 
is to listen with an open heart and an open mind. Now in a world filled with prejudice and cultural conditioning, it is extremely hard to find people that are willing to be objective for a moment and put aside their preconditioning and to think for a moment, if you dare, what is the purpose of your life? Now what I mean by open heart and open mind is very simple. And you can try this when you get home, it's no tricks to it. Turn the glass upside down and see if you can pour yourself a glass of water. You can pour all day, you'll never fill the glass. The mind and the heart are receptacles for information and values. Minimally, you have to listen in order to receive it. And you have to remove for a moment the obstructions. Unfortunately, when you ask most people the question, what is the purpose of life? Such an important question such a critical question. They will not tell you what they have concluded from life experiment, experience. They won't tell you what they have obtained through reasoning or logic. They won't tell you what they have from their own self-conviction. Usually, if you ask this question, They'll tell you what someone else said. Or they'll tell you what is commonly presumed by most people. What my father said the purpose of life is. What my mother said the purpose of life is. What the minister of my church said the purpose of life is. What my teacher or my professor in school said what the purpose of life is. What my friend said. If I ask anyone about the purpose of eating, why do we eat, everyone will say in one way or another, we eat for nutrition. Very simple. If I ask anyone, anybody why do they work, they say I work because I have to support myself and my family in an honorable way. A simple answer to a simple question. If we ask a series of questions like that, why do we wash? Why do we dress? They will answer all of these questions by saying, this is very simple. This is a common necessity for all human beings. And if you ask this question to a hundred people in a hundred different places in the world, you will get just about the same answers. Then I ask you to ask yourself, why is it that when we ask the simple question, what is the purpose of our lives? Why do we get so many different answers? It is because people haven't really thought about it. It's too frightening. Not the question itself is frightening, but what's frightening is that if we answer it clearly, it may change our lives indelibly, and we are afraid of change. The human being inertly innately is afraid and apprehensive of change. This is why it's so easy just to follow, to imitate, 
blindly because then you don't have to feel like you're responsible. You can blame somebody else. Well, think about it tonight. Is our purpose in this world simply to eat and sleep and dress and work and acquire some material things and enjoy ourselves? Well, the hedonists, they will tell you, that is the pleasure seekers, the worldly people who only want to enjoy themselves, who are only concerned about taste and touch and feel and smell and have and possess. Those people who think they have the world in their hands or that the world is in a cup of brandy, they will tell you that life is only for enjoyment, so enjoy all that you can. Is this our purpose? Why are we born? What is the object of our existence? And what is the wisdom behind the creation of man and this tremendous universe? Think about that question. Think about it seriously. Now some people will argue that there is simply no proof of any divine origin of this world. And there is no proof that there is a God. And there is no proof that this universe has come about through any divine purpose. There are those who argue that. And some of them, they occupy some of the higher places in academia, in government. Some of them occupy some of the elite positions in society and in our lives. Some of them are called central personalities. But they themselves are confused. They also have their own frustrations and I'd like to share a statistic with you. The greatest amount of misery, the greatest amount of suicide, the greatest amount of confusion and disparagement exists among that class of people. So evidently, even they don't have the answers. Now there are people who argue this way and they say that perhaps this world came about by chance. That means random. That's what chance means, random. Like going to the gambling house. You call it here the gaming rooms. They have a nice name for it here. It's a place of immorality. It's a place where you put your life savings on the line. You're trying to get something for nothing. You put your hard-earned money. Sometimes the man doesn't tell his wife or the wife doesn't tell her husband and they lose their house and their lives, taking a chance, trying to earn something for nothing. And the government has set it up and supported it with your tax dollars. And you're so foolish that you think that after you gamble for five years and you've lost 50 or $60,000, that if you win $25,000, you get real happy. So thinking that this world came about by chance is the same as thinking that when you put money in a slot machine that the numbers come up by chance. They don't. Everybody knows that the casinos are rigged and only the house wins all the time. But to think that this world came about in the same way that people gamble, random choice, well, let's put that to a test. This is an example that you can do in your home with your children. Take 10 marbles. Number them one to ten. 
and put them inside of a bag and shake the bag. And then close your eyes without looking inside that bag, pull out number one, pull out marble number two, pull out marble number three, in that order. Just ten marbles, that's all. Five, ten. What do you think the chances are pulling out those ten marbles in that order without looking at them? Does anybody here that's a mathematic genius, knows about calculus, knows the random chance? Does anybody know the chance? Twenty-six million to one. That's only 10 marbles. That's called a micro example. Now let's go a little bit further out to a mic macro example. The Earth that we are on is one planet among nine, or some people say 11, in our solar system, isn't it? And our sun that gives energy and light and gravity is the center of our solar system. And our sun is only one star, and it happens to be one of the smaller stars in our galaxy called the Milky Way. And the Milky Way is only one of the smaller galaxies in the nebula called the Andromeda. And the Andromeda has itself millions of galaxies like the one that our sun is a part of. And there are millions or literally countless galaxies, clusters of galaxies like the Andromeda that have been predicted by sending out sound and light. And they have sent out sound and light that has never returned. Now all of this diverse order that we see in the heavens that we are able to somewhat calculate and predict that we call night and day, time, all of this is in order that allows us to calculate. Tell me, if you can't pull out 10 marbles in order, how did all of this come in order? Evidently, man didn't do it because man is only a drop of water on the earth, significantly nothing. You can't even see him if you get a certain distance. He's forgotten about. So I say to you, certainly, this whole great world with all of its great orchestration could not have just come together. And even if we accept the Big Bang Theory, Someone had to create that combustion because after the bang came about, everything came in order. So order does not come from disorder. You can't get out of your bed in the morning and don't make your bed and come back and your bed is made unless you got a maid. You can't demolish a house and come back and the house came back together unless you got a reconstruction crew. Order doesn't come from disorder. Order comes from an order. An order means a legislation. It means a science. It means a fact. It means a determination. And if man wasn't around, when that Big Bang took place, he had nothing to do with that determination or anything after it. Here I would like to mention a few verses of the Quran that address this subject because the Quran was revealed more than 1400 years ago, a book of 6,626 verses that has been retained and memorized, preserved since the time that it was revealed more than 1424 years ago. Memorized in the time of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, who received it in his own life. Memorized by his companions. And the same Quran is with us today. And among the people sitting here, I'm sure there are five or ten people who have memorized the entire Quran. This is the phenomena. If Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, never left anything else as a proof of his miracle and his prophethood to the world, it would be the Quran. 
I asked my brother to recite just a few verses and then I'll translate it. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لآيات لأولي الألباب الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار I will only translate two or three of those verses because this is enough to address this issue that I'm, I'm speaking to. This verse says, Inna fi khalqi samawati wal ardi wa akhtilaf al layni wal nahar The Quran says, Verily, in the creation of the heavens and the earth, And in the alternation of the night and the day, surely this itself is a sign for those who reflect. Those who reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth, on their creator, while they are standing while they are sitting, while they are lying down on their sides, always they are reflecting on the signs of the heavens and the earth. They say, our Lord, our sustainer, not for any vain, foolish, random purpose have you created all of this, so save us from the chastisement of the fire. Dear brothers and sisters and guests, this verse of the Quran, these verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God Almighty, has mentioned very clearly to us by first drawing our attention to the creation of ourselves, that's first. the different postures of the human body. And because he's the creator and his throne exists over the heavens and the earth, he comes from his throne down, meaning in terms of knowledge befitting his person. So he first speaks about the creation of the heavens and the earth, something that man cannot construe. Then he says, the alternation of the night and the day as it appears to us. Then he speaks about the posture of the human being, standing. You know we are different when we're standing. Our mind is even different. We have a different demeanor when we're standing. Then he says, while they are sitting, and we have a different demeanor when we're sitting. Psychologists will tell you the human being has different postures according to the posture of the body. So when you're standing, you can be arrogant. When you're standing, you can make proclamations. When you're sitting, usually you're receiving, you're listening, you're a little more humble. When you're lying down on your side, either you're sick or you're weak or you're about to sleep. These are the postures of the human psychology. Look how beautiful the verse is. The wise people who fear God, they are thinking of him in all these postures, in all conditions. And they say, O oh God, surely, not for any vain or random or foolish purpose have you created all of this. Save me from myself. Save me from my vanity. Save me from my foolishness. 
Save me from my rebellion. Save me from my disbelief. Save me from the chastisement of the fire. Dear brothers and sisters, certainly there is a creator. And certainly that creator deserves to be acknowledged. And certainly that creator deserves to be obeyed. And definitely that creator has no associates or comparisons. For instance, we have to ask ourselves a further question. When you see a bridge, a building, an automobile, you automatically consider the person or the company that designed it. You would never think when you look at these new cars, this new technology, you would never think that it created itself or it just happened to be there. Let's take something a little more simple. If you were walking out in the outback, that's what you call it here, isn't it? If you were walking in the outback, we call it the desert in America, and you saw a watch, a very expensive watch, maybe like the watch that I'm wearing here, like not expensive but intricate, a world time, three or four different alarms on it. If you saw a watch laying down on the ground, would you think to yourself that it was always there? No. You would think someone left it there because you know that it is not part of the natural landscape. It's not part of that environment. It has been designed by someone and lost by someone, wouldn't you? This is just a watch. It's not really that intricate. It's not like the human eye. It's not like the sun. It's not like the earth with its, uh, with its uh, different ecosystems. It's not like that. So how could you think that this watch had a designer, but this universe doesn't have a designer? It just came about. When you see a nuclear plant, an orbiting space station, and by the way, unfortunately, the orbiting space station that you can look up at the sky and see, it might be there and it might fall out of orbit any time. Because America and the Soviet Union, they don't have the money. They have the money to fight a war, but they don't have the money to support the space program any longer. So the $56 billion that has been spent on the space station Maybe it's over with. When you see a nuclear plant or an orbiting space station, a super international airport, you have to be thoroughly impressed with the engineering dynamics that are involved. Yet, these are just things that are manufactured by human beings. Then what about the human body with its massive and intricate control systems? Think about it. Think about the brain, how it thinks, how it functions, how it analyzes, how it stores information, retrieves information, distinguishes light and categorizes information in a millionth of a second. And how it does that constantly. Think about the brain for a moment. Think about those mobile phones for a moment. I would ask you to be courteous enough to cut your mobile phone off. Your wife, if she's not here, she won't mind. Your husband, if he's not here, he won't mind. Your office, they won't mind. So just cut it off or put it on another mode. That's courtesy. Now we're talking about the brain that made the automobile, the rocket ships, the boats, and so on. Think about the brain and who made that. Think about the heart, how it pumps throughout the body, throughout the life of the person. The heart pumps continuously 
I mean, it starts at the inception when the child is inside the womb. The heart is already pumping. And from that time until death, this heart is pumping without the will of the person whose chest it is in. The heart taking in and discharging blood throughout the body and maintaining that steady precision throughout the life of that person. Think about it. Think about the kidneys. What kind of function do they carry? The purifying instrument of the body that performs hundreds of chemical analysis simultaneously and controls the level of toxicity in the body. And it does this automatically. Think about your eyes, the human camera that adjusts, focus, interrupts, evaluates, applies color automatically, the natural reception and adjustment to light and distance, automatic. Think about it. Who created that? Who designed the eye? With all the technology, there's no replacement for the human eye. Even they have not been able to create a robot that is able to mimic the blink of the eye. If they made a robot to blink and imitate the blink of the human eye, it would throw the robot out of sync because he couldn't keep the synchronization going like the eye does. Just something simple like that. Who created that? Who mastered that? Who planned that? And who regulates that? Human beings themselves? What's your answer? Of course not. What about this universe? Think about this. The Earth is one planet in our solar system, and our solar system is one of the systems in the Milky Way, the example I gave you previously. Who created that? Who designed that? Who maintains that perpetually until it continues to expand? And according to one scientific theory, what is it? That the, that the universe is expanding as we are living. And one day it will expand until it will implode. Implode means it will explode from the inside, not from the outside, but cave in. Now this is a theory. We don't know. But we do know it is expanding. Yet, for all intents and purposes, it's not affecting the organization that we see. Who designed that? Who controls that? Is it man himself? Of course not. Man just stumbled on the theory yesterday. Certainly there's a creator. And that creator deserves to be acknowledged. And that creator deserves to be obeyed. Because that creator has the only one has the right to legislate and to adjudicate and to be for humans who have the highest intellect to conform to. And definitely, that creator has no associates and that creator has no comparisons. Did all of this synchronization, balance, harmony, variation, design, maintenance, operation, and infinite numeration, did this happen by chance, by random? And also do these things function perpetually and perfectly, also by chance? And do they keep on reproducing themselves and maintaining themselves also by chance? What do you think? Of course not. That will be totally illogical and foolish. And we're not illogical and we're not foolish. But maybe we just didn't think about that. At least it would indicate that however that came to be, it is totally outside of the realm of human capability and we would all agree to that. We should all be in consensus to that, that all of this is outside of the realm of human 
capability. The being, the almighty power, God, the creator of the universe, the source of energy, the source of power, the source of existence, call him, call it, call the creator what you will, but the principle is the same. It is beyond the capability of human beings themselves. We are subject, we are subordinate, we are not the principle ourselves. The creator of existence has the knowledge to design, to proportion, has created all of this and is responsible for maintaining all of this. That creator is the only one that is deserving of praise and gratitude. If I gave each one of you a hundred pounds or a hundred dollars for no reason, if before you left here, I said, everyone here just for coming, there's a hundred dollars on your way out. Don't forget to pick up your hundred dollars, but just leave your name and say thank you to the person who gives you the hundred dollars. Would you leave your name? Would you say thank you? Of course you would. No one, you would stand in a queue to leave. <laughs> so I ask you, what about your eyes? What about your kidneys? What about your brain? What about your life? What about your breath? What about your children? What about the life, the opportunities, the resources that you have been given, are you grateful for that? Or do you say, I earned all of that? Is the one that gave you life not worthy of praise and thanks? Is the one that gave you life not worthy of your worship and recognition? My sisters and my brothers and my guests, that, in a nutshell, is the purpose and the goal of this life. One, to recognize and acknowledge the Creator. Secondly, to conform to the laws of that Creator. And thirdly, to give praise and gratitude and worship to that Creator. That's the initial purpose of our lives. Just as the initial responsibility of a child as they're growing up is to respect their parents but before they can respect their parents don't they need to know them you know your parents therefore you respect your parents because you know that you wouldn't be here if they were not your parents secondly they nurtured you they guided you. They helped you through school and all your problems. And even if you don't fully respect them or listen to them, you have to be psychologically dependent upon them and grateful to them, obligated and indebted to them. So what about the Creator who made your parents and their 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 parents and, their parents and, their parents and the whole world? This whole cosmos that we are experiencing. Is that creator not worthy of your recognition? Is that creator not worthy of your respect? Is that creator not worthy of your praise? Is that creator not worthy of your worship? It is just as fundamental and even more fundamental than respecting or recognizing your parents. That's the initial, primary, foundation purpose of our lives to come to recognize appreciate Almighty God the Creator by scientific means by dialectical means through mathematical means through worship through reflection any way you are able to to come to the grips and come to grips with the fact that you yourself are not your own benefactor, but that you are benefiting from something which was given that you didn't even ask for. 
I don't think that anyone who considers themselves clever or scientific or analytical would have much argument with this purpose. They may have their own set of rationales, their own justifications, their own ideas, their own theories, but it all boils down to the same thing. Because with all their ideas and all their theories, they seem to be headed in the same place. Because I don't see anybody that has escaped death except Walt Disney. Uh, at least uh, they would have us to think that. Or Steven Spielberg, Hollywood or Charliewood or Bollywood. <laughs> but the reality of life is that everyone, every day you wake up, you are closer to death. And that's what you need to think about. You're not closer to your objective. You're not closer to what you've been working for all your lives. You are closer to death because that is the ultimate place that all of us are heading. From the womb to the tomb. That's it. And Michael Jackson will have to make another thriller. Brothers and sisters, this is something that you and I need to deal with seriously. We need to reconcile this issue. We need to resolve this issue. Don't let death sneak up on you because babies die. Adolescents die. Young, vibrant, intelligent, beautiful, well-endowed individuals die. Arrogant people die. Even executioners die. And death is a doorway that if the creator of the heavens and the earth had no other power over his creatures who consider themselves to be powerful individuals, independent, if he had no other power, no other sign of his power except death, it would be enough. Because anybody with power, anybody with resources, governments or other than that, if there was something that they would do to buy themselves out of, it would be what? Death. But it's not negotiable. Dear brothers and sisters, let us all witness that there's nothing worthy of worship. That's what we should all bear witness. There's nothing in the heavens or the earth, no principle, no power, no sovereign, not a man, nor a group of men, not a society, nor a nation, nor a coalition of nations that have any power over life and death or creation, except who? The Creator. Let us all bear witness that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, none to be acknowledged except the Creator. Let us all bear witness to that. Let us all say that there's none to be worshipped, to be recognized except the Creator. Let's say that. Is there a problem? Is there a stutter? Is there a hesitation? If there's someone who thinks that they are self-created, if there's someone who thinks that they're outside of this cycle I just spoke of, stand up, because you're the one that should be talking here. Because you're going to announce to us a theory that none of us know about. If not, we should all bear witness, or at least if I called your name and that was your name, you would come up here and say, if I said to you, somebody handed me an envelope, and it said that, Someone by the name of David Matthews is the recipient of $2,000. We picked his name out of a hat, and he's recipient of $2,000. Come on down! <laughs> if he was upstairs there, he might have fall out the, he fall out the balcony trying to get down here. 
you see. So for your own motivation, you have no problem. But for the creator, you got a problem. Muslims say la ilaha illallah. That's all it means. It just means that there's none to be recognized. It means none to be worshipped. It means none to be conformed to or obeyed except the creator. This is what Jesus said. This is what Moses said. This is what Abraham said. This is what David said. This is what Solomon said. Peace and blessings be upon all of them. This is what Isaac said. This is what Ismail said. This is what John the Baptist said. This is what Jesus Christ said. That's what the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, said. All the prophets, all those men that received revelation from God, they all said one thing. La ilaha illallah. A simple statement they said. Dear friends, dear Muslims, let us now discuss the second half of our topic. What do you know about Islam? One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, pray. Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims. Dear friends, dear Muslims, let us now discuss the second half of our topic. What do you know about Islam? Not what you have heard about Islam, especially not recently. Not what you have heard from Mr. Bush or Mr. Blair. or Mr. Darwin, or Mr. Einstein, or Mr. Disney, or Mr. Spielberg. Not what you've heard from the New York Times, or the London Times, or NBC, or CNN. No. What do you really know about Islam as a fact? Because the word Islam is not a uh, abstract terminology. It's not nebulous. It's not something that could be looked at from different perspectives and thought to be something different from different people's views. No, it's not like that. Not what your father said. Certainly, there's a difference between a man and a father. There's something different, obviously, between a male and a man. Now, I don't mean male man like the one that delivers the mail. 
but it's difference between a M-A-L-E and a man. At least it used to be a clear distinction. <laughs> a male is gender, born with that gender. Now they might choose from their own volition and want for themselves a different gender and pay a lot of money to do that or to fool you. <laughs> but male is a gender and female is a gender, but a man, this is a title of responsibility. That's different. So a male that does not fulfill the responsibilities of man is not completing the mandate of birth and God. They're just a male. And the same is for a female. Because the male and the female, they have different anatomies. They have different psychologies. They have different roles. Now there are others who will tell you that that is not so. They will say that. Women are equal to men in all respects, and they are competing, climbing up poles and digging ditches and everything. <laughs> but no men have opted to try to have children. <laughs> it's the same as Islam. Islam is a principle. Islam is a comprehensive system. Islam is a law. You may call it a religion. I don't like to use that word. It's too restricting. When we say religion, a whole lot of things just come up in the mind from all the movies and books and things that we've read, religion. Seems like kind of restriction, like a suit you might wear like going into some place like, like it might be to some people, virtual reality. You've heard of that, right? So like virtual reality, you can pay for, you can go somewhere and develop and have your own religion. But Islam is not like that. No, it's not like that. Islam is a law. Islam is a system. Islam is a legislation. Islam is a regulation, and therefore it has dimensions by which you can determine and identify it. Now a Muslim is an individual who makes the profession that they belong to or they are attached to that system. Do you judge a system by the people who say that they are a part of it? No, you don't. And that's why they have what they call disclosures. So that if somebody works for my company and they do something wrong, my company will not be liable. Is that correct? Because I've already made a disclosure that this person does not necessarily represent our company in policy or so forth and so on. I've made a disclosure of that. Well, God has also made a disclosure that the human beings themselves, God is not indicted and God is not imperfect and God does not die, and God does not have the limitations, and God doesn't make mistakes, and God is not immoral, and God is not prejudiced. But some Muslims are. So we don't judge or indict a system of life by the people who claim to be that. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Jim Jones did some years ago. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Jeffrey Dahmer did. We would not indict Jesus Christ by what Charles Manson did. We would not indict Jesus Christ by the Oklahoma bomber. What was his name? <laughs> Timothy McVeigh. Was he a Christian fundamentalist? We would not indict him. We would not call any of those people Christian fanatics, Christian terrorists. We would not say that the IRA in, in uh, Ireland, that they are Christian fanatics. We don't say that. So how do we say Muslim fanatics, Islamic fundamentalists, Islamic terrorists? How do we indict a global faith of more than 1,500 years 
with a legislation, with principles, with dignity, with a record, how do we indict that entire faith and all the people who's with that faith and put them in some kind of classification and put on them an oxymoron? You know what that is, don't you? An oxymoron is a word that means just the opposite of what you put next to it. Islamic terrorist, Islamic fanatic, those are oxymorons. A person cannot be Islamic by, by definition if they are fanatic. They cannot be. Because Islam is a system of peace, a system of submission and surrender to God, a system of dignity. Now if somebody who is a Muslim doesn't act that way, if a Muslim acts as a criminal way, what are they? They're a Muslim criminal, is that correct? If a Christian doesn't act the way Jesus Christ spoke, how he lived and his message, if a Christian commits a crime, what are they? A Christian criminal. A Jewish person commits a crime, what are they? A Jewish criminal. A Buddhist, a Hindu, or anyone else that commits a crime, they are what? Criminals. But you don't indict the faith because of the criminal, do you? If that were the case, America, Great Britain, France, Germany, all the so-called advanced nations, they got more criminals wearing suits than all the criminals that are in jail. They would all be criminal governments. <laughs> now we hear the terms Islam and Muslims quite often. And we read about Islam and Muslims in the periodicals, textbooks of colleges and universities. We hear and we see a lot of inaccurate, misleading, and purposeful misinformation through the media. And we have to admit that some of this misinformation, some of this misrepresentation, and some of this distortion has been perpetuated by Muslims themselves. We have to admit that. That is true to a certain extent. Yet, one out of every five people in this world is a Muslim. There are more than 1.4 billion Muslims in the world. We don't say 1.4 billion Arabs, Asians, Africans. We didn't say that. Because you cannot find any country in the world and even if you discover a new country, there'll be some Muslims there. <laughs> White, black, green, yellow, tall, short, male, female, poor, rich, of every ethnicity. The Muslim nation, the Muslim brotherhood is a global brotherhood, a global nation, and Muslims are everywhere in the world. One out of every five people in this world is a Muslim. Just like one out of every five people in this world is a Chinese. And nearly one out of every five people in this world is from the Indian continent. These are statistics that we can support. Go to your computer, do a search. Go to the encyclopedia and do a search. Go to the almanac and do a search and you will verify this statistic. And you know everything about India and you know everything about China. But I ask you the question, why don't you know something about Islam? You know the language of China, you know the language of India, you know the constitution, everything can be found. People talk, you eat Chinese food, you eat Indian food. But I ask you, what do you really know about Islam. What do you know about the social, the economic, the political, the historical factors about Islam? Why don't you know about Islam? What is it that joins over 37 nations together into a brotherhood, a configuration, a common fraternity? What makes a brother in Saudi Arabia my brother? and I'm from America, and what makes my brother from Pakistan my brother, and what makes an Australian my brother, a French Muslim, a German Muslim, a Scandinavian Muslim, an English Muslim, an Indonesian Muslim, 
What makes them my brother? We're not the same color. We don't have the same culture. We don't speak the same language. What makes us brothers is our bond of faith. It is Islam that makes us brothers. What are the accurate characteristics of this misunderstood way of life that is followed by the greater part of humanity? I'll try to provide you with some facts, but in addition to this, as I mentioned to you before, it is necessary for you to be open-minded and open-hearted. Otherwise, you're gonna miss what I tell you because you're gonna turn that glass upside down. The word Islam means surrender, submission, and obedience. Surrender, submission, and obedience to whom? The creator of the heavens and the earth. You can say Allah, or you can say the creator. You can say the source of creation. You can say the principle behind existence, you can say. All those attributes belong to the creator. The all-wise, the all-knowing, the absolute, the eternal, the one upon whom all depends while the creator depends upon none. We say Allah, Allah, because in the Arabic language this is a very clear nomenclature. So you see, if I said God, if I spell it backwards, what is it? See? And that's why some people might even take a dog as God. I mean, after all, if a dog is a man's best friend, he could become his God. We say Allah. And this is not a God of the Muslims. Allah comes from the, the article. A-L meaning the, meaning only, meaning particular, meaning distinct, A-L, Al, and Allah means that which is worshipped, that which is adored, that which is obeyed, that which is inclined to, that which is submitted to. So when we say Allah, it means the only one worthy of worship, recognition, and praise. Allah. We say Allah because in the Arabic word, this means uniqueness and without gender. So from this point, I'm going to use the word Allah and you know that I'm not speaking of the Muslim God. I'm speaking of the creator of the heavens and earth, your Lord and my Lord. The same God of Moses and Abraham and Jacob and the tribes and John the Baptist and Jesus Christ and the prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. The same God. And none of them use the word God. In the Hebrew language, or the Aramaic language, or the Arabic language, the word Elah or Allah is the only word they ever used because it is a very clear, distinct name. It has never been used for any tangible thing, nor even an idea. The word Islam is derived from the word Salama. Salama means to be at peace. It also means safety. It also means security. Therefore, a Muslim is a person that surrenders to whom? Allah. A Muslim is a person that submits and obeys the law of whom? Allah. Almighty God. And through this submission obtains peace for themselves. You see the formula is very simple. When I surrender, to the law, when I conform to the law and the legislation which is intended for me, that means that is my natural disposition. Therefore, I become what? A conformist. I am in order. I am in harmony. And by being in order and harmony, the things I'm supposed to receive comes to me. So it's natural to be a Muslim. 
It's unnatural not to be. We can immediately see by that definition that all the prophets of Almighty God were what? Muslims. Because even Almighty God said in the revelation that we recited before from the surah which is called al bayna Fadlu Habibi. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا الله إلا ليعبدوا الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء ويقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة. This verse from the Quran says: "وما أمروا إلا ليعبدوا الله مخلصين له الدين حنفاء أو يقيم الصلاة ويؤت الزكاة وذلك دين القيمة." The verse is very clear. It says, "And they." The human beings, the prophets of Almighty God, they were not ordered to do anything except to worship, to recognize, to obey their Lord, and to be mukhlis. Mukhlis means to be sincere towards God, to be clean, to be moral, towards the legislation that he ordered them. What legislation did God order them? Every prophet that came to every people. He came with a book. He came with a message. He came with a behavior. He came pleading with the people, telling them, do not worship idols. Do not worship other deities. Do not be pagans. Don't associate partners with God. Do not disobey your creator. Do not. Ignore your creator. Be decent. Be upright. Be moral. Be kind. Be gentle. وَمَا أُمِنُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهُ مُخْلِسِينَ لَحُدِّينَ هُنَفَى هُنَفَى It means to be Hanif. Hanif means being straight with God. Not allowing any interference between you and God. No partners. No associates, holding your relation with God sacred, and therefore what God has ordered you to do, to put that order before every other order. This is called Hanifa. And to establish prayer, because after all, what can we do for God? What can we do for the one that created us? What can we do? If your mother and father gave birth to you, taught you, all what your mother did for you while you were young, Staying up at night while she suffered with you through school, through college, and after you finish, they become old and you put them inside of an old age home, a retirement home. Shame on you. What can you do for your parents after they did all of that for you? What can you do for them? Nothing. Then what can we do for God? Nothing except to worship him to acknowledge him, to conform to his law, to establish the prayer in your lives and to be charitable. And God said, being decent towards God and being decent towards the human beings, this is the right way. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, if you read the scriptures carefully without your own interpretation or somebody else's addition or fabrication, you will find that this was the simple message of all the prophets who confirmed one another. Not one of these prophets ever said, I am God, worship me. Jesus Christ did not say, I am God, worship me. Now, if there's a Christian in this room that can tell me that Jesus said in his own words, not Matthew, not Mark, not Luke, not John, not Paul, but Jesus said, I am God, worship me. Then we will raise $5,000 for you tonight before you leave. Break your Bibles out. 
Call somebody up. Go make a phone call. Get the verse. You'll never find it. You'll find somebody else's word alluding to that. You'll find somebody else's reference appearing that. But Jesus never said to anybody, I am God, worship me. He said, my father, he didn't say my father who art in heaven because he was not exclusively the servant of God. He said, when he taught them how to pray, I used to be a Christian. I still love Jesus Christ. I'm still connected to his message. I know it very well. He said, and you know that he said, our father, didn't he say that? He didn't mean our father in the sense that he gave birth to us, but he said, our Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, not my name, not our name. Thy kingdom come, not my kingdom come, not our kingdom come, if he's part of the Trinity, if he's divine, if he's part of God, or he's next to God, he will say, our kingdom come. He said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Did he say that? Did he say that? So now if he said give us this day our daily bread, that means Jesus and his mother could not have been divine because if he said give us this day our daily bread, you and I, we eat and we drink. Jesus and his mother, they ate and they drank. And you know and I know that when you eat and drink, the body only uses some of it. The rest of it, the body evacuates. Now, can you imagine God defecating and urinating? Let's move on with the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who do what? trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, huh? but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Now does this sound like God praying to you? Did you ever think about that? Now that's the Lord's prayer. That's the evidence of that. Now we know Jesus said that. That wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and Paul. Jesus said that. Dear brothers and sisters and guests, go home tonight and palm through all the pages of your Bible, and I guarantee you will never find it once anywhere. So where did this come from? In three or four different occasions, it is mentioned in your scripture that I have read throughout my life before I became a Muslim that Jesus walked off and he fell down on his face and he worshiped God. Did he say that? Now, is that God bowing down to himself? Is that God calling on himself? No, Jesus said, I am Jesus who is sent, and the one who is sent is not like the one who sent me. Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing, but whatsoever the one orders me, the one who sent me tells me to do, that is what I do. We cannot take Jesus out of the context of what Jesus said himself and make Jesus what we want him to be. We can't make Jesus a man God because the Romans and the Greeks had men gods. Because Jesus said, take not my message unto the Greeks, the Romans, the Samaritans, for my message, and I was sent to whom? The lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. Isn't that what Jesus said? So Paul was mistaken when he said, I became apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus said, don't take my message to them. Brothers and sisters, we can immediately see by such an example and definition that Jesus Christ himself submitted himself to God, that Moses and Abraham submitted themselves to God, that Isaac and Ismael submitted themselves to God, that John the Baptist submitted himself to God, and submission means surrender, and surrender means salama, salama. The one who does that is called Muslim. So what was Jesus? 
What was Abraham? What was Moses? What was David? Don't get confused about the Arabic word now. It only means one that surrenders. So say it in English or say it in Arabic. It means Muslim. Everyone is a Muslim, a child that has no volition of its own inside the womb of its mother is submitting to the natural disposition. What is it? Muslim. And can you tell me that a pure child that when it's born, it's already born with sins that it did not do? Now that doesn't even make sense. A child is born out of the womb and it inherits the sins of the world that Jesus already died for. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> now that's double, that's real double jeopardy. Double jeopardy for Jesus and double jeopardy for the child. I ask you, what was the Psalms of David? Did you ever read it real well? Did you ever read this, the Psalms of David? The Proverbs of Solomon? Did you ever listen and read what John the Baptist said, compare that to the gospel of Jesus? If you did and you also read the Quran, it will seem like you're reading the same words over and over. Why? Because they were all brothers and prophets, a one chain of prophets that were sent by Almighty God to the human beings, you and I. So when a child comes out of the womb of its mother, at that time that God has ordered it, what is it? A Muslim. When the sun goes around in its orbit, what is it? According to law, it's a Muslim. When the moon goes around the earth, what is it? By law, by decree, by definition, it is a Muslim. The law of gravity is a Muslim law. Everything that submits to Almighty God and follows what God has ordered it to do is what? A Muslim. All the prophets came speaking different languages to their respective people. And the only prophet that came to the entire world was the one that said that he came for the whole world. Jesus never said, I came for the whole world. He never said that. He said, I have been sent to the lost sheep of the tribe of Israel. He came to correct the corruptions and the excesses of the Bani Israel. And he came to announce what? The gospel. What does the gospel mean? What does the gospel mean? The good news. Good news of who? Good news of what? And Jesus Christ's mission and his prophethood was only two years and four months. Did you know that? His whole mission, his whole prophethood was only two years and four months because he came to announce that someone would come after him, someone that would hear from God and speak, someone whose behavior would address all the problems of the world, someone who would come with a book that would remain with you forever. Okay, what prophet came after Jesus Christ to fulfill that prophecy? And also, he would also confirm Jesus Christ and mention Jesus Christ. The Quran is the only book that came after Jesus Christ, that was revealed after Jesus Christ, that mentions the mother of Jesus Christ, that mentions the birth of Jesus Christ, that mentions the miracles of Jesus Christ. We are Muslims. We believe in the miraculous or the phenomenal birth of Jesus Christ. We believe it totally. God can do whatever he wants to do. And we believe that if God created the heavens and the earth by his command, if God says be, what is it? It is. And if God created Adam without a mother and father, Adam, our common father, had no mother and father, no parents. Adam was created by God. Adam was just a sperm drop mixed with mud. And God said be. Adam became and then God said be and Eve became and from those two all the human beings came 
So who was the father and mother of Adam? Who was the father and mother of Eve? So at least Jesus had a mother. So what's more difficult for God, Adam and Eve or Jesus? We believe that Jesus' mother, Mary, she was never penetrated by any man to create Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was born without sperm. Because God can order any woman to be pregnant, and she'll be pregnant. Because before Mary, remember the story of Zachariah. Zachariah was 110, and his wife was 90. Do you remember that story? Zachariah, the prophet, who was the father of John, he was 110. His wife was 90. And he prayed to God for a son. He said, oh God, I have no children. God, give me a son. God answered him. The angel Gabriel came to him and said, you will have a son. He wanted to know how. I would want to know too. <laughs> he said, oh God, how will I have a son when I'm an old man? I don't have any water. And my wife is barren. She doesn't create no eggs in that language. She's barren. She's way beyond menopause. She's menopause. <laughs> but God said, so be it. When God orders a thing, it will be. And when Zachariah, a prophet of God, went back to his wife and said, guess what? I had a vision and God said to me through the angel that you will become pregnant. Of course she laughed, I would too. <laughs> but just as she laughed, she found something moving in her stomach. And guess who was the child that was born that was John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus Christ. Because Zachariah was the cousin of Hannah. And Hannah was the woman that prayed to God for a son that she could give to the priest so that he could become a priest. And she prayed to God and God told her through the angel Gabriel again that she will have a son. No that she will have a child and she had that child but when the child was a girl she said oh God verily I have given birth but it's a woman it's a girl the angel said to her so be it this girl will be the chief of the women in the hereafter and that's what Mary is and when Mary was born, she was given over to the care of Zachariah, who was the chief priest of the temple. And Mary was put into a place where her own apartment. And when Zachariah, who was the only one with the key, used to go and check on her, he found every time he checked on her, she had food. And he used to ask her, Mary, where do you get this food from? Why? What was strange about the food? I'll tell you what was strange. In the winter, she had fruit. She had fruit from the summer. And in the summer, she had the fruit from the winter. Because she was selected by God. The prayer of Hannah. God answered her prayer by giving Hannah a girl who would give birth to the son that Hannah asked for. That's how God works. And while she was in that room, the angel Gabriel again came to her and said, Oh Mary, God announces to you a child that you will have whose son, I mean a son, whose name will be Esau. Esau. Jesus in the Spanish language or Jesus in the English language, but in Arabic, Esau. al Masih. al Masih means the anointed the appointed, the Messiah, or the Christ. 
And Mary said to the angel, thinking that he was a man, if you fear Allah, don't come near me. Like any one of you women, any one of you decent women, if a man appeared to you in your bedroom, you would say, get out of here. Maybe you wouldn't say, if you fear God, you might pull for your gun or something. <laughs> but Mary said, if you fear God, don't come near me. The angel said, Mary, fear not. I'm a messenger from God to announce to you that you will have a son by the name of Esau. Peace and blessings be upon him. Mary said, how will I have a son when I've never been touched by any man and I'm not a woman that walks the streets? What is she saying? She's not a harlot. She was untouched. She's a virgin. She doesn't even mix with men. So how she will be pregnant? The angel said to her, so be it. When God orders a thing, he says to it, what? Be and it is. And just when the angel said that to her, Mary found herself just like the wife of Zachariah, pregnant, conceiving. And to make a long story short, when Jesus was born, Mary was ashamed because the people was already saying she's a harlot, she's a this, she's a that. Look, she's pregnant. She had to go out. Something had to happen. How did she get pregnant? She asked God, what should I say? God told her, don't say anything. Point to the child. The child will speak for himself and clear you of everything they say. And Jesus did that. That was his first miracle. Yes, Jesus was born without a father. That's the first phenomena. Secondly, Jesus spoke from the cradle. Is that correct? To clear his mother. That was the first miracle. Jesus Christ caused the deaf, the deaf to hear, caused the blind to see, caused the lepers to be healed, caused the dead to be raised up, blew into a clay pigeon, and caused it to fly off into life. Yes, Jesus, he fed more than 10,000 people from seven fish and seven loaves of bread. Jesus did that because God gave him the power to do that. When they asked him, how do you do such things? What did Jesus say? I can of my own self do nothing. But whatever the one who sent me orders me, that is what I do. And when someone called him good master, touched his garment, he pulled his garment from her hands and said to her, what? Why dost thou call me good when there's none good except whom? the one that is in heaven. Jesus made it clear even to Pontius Pilate when the high priest wanted to indict him, calling him the son of God, calling him the king of the Jews. Pontius Pilate said to him, what do you say about the crime that they accuse you of? What do you say about that? That you call yourself the son of God. Now that was an accusation that he was committing a blasphemy according to the Jewish law. He said, thou sayest I'm the son of God. And what did Pontius Pilate do? Pontius Pilate said, I wash my hands and I find no fault with this man. Isn't that what Pontius Pilate said? His response was that Jesus was not guilty of what they said because by what he said, he denied it. So if Jesus denied that, how can somebody else for all these years keep calling him something that he denied? I say all these things to you because we Muslims, we love Jesus Christ maybe more than those who call themselves Christians. After all, we know more about his birth, about his life, about his message, about his mother, about his grandmother. We know more about his miracles and they have been confirmed and detailed in the Quran in our form of worship and what we believe is exactly what Jesus believed. But Jesus never said, I'm God, worship me. And we don't worship Jesus Christ and we don't worship Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We say that Jesus Christ is the son of Mary. He is the Messiah. He is a word from God and a spirit that God put in the womb of Mary. 
and that God put his words in Jesus Christ's mouth and God gave him the power to do the miracles. That's what we say. We say that Jesus Christ was a great prophet and a messenger of God and that he announced the coming of the comforter, that counselor who would make all things clear, who would bring a book that would stay with the world forever, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. On the basis of that, I believe that if loving Jesus Christ, following his message, knowing about him, if that means being Christian, then I'm more Christian than most of the people who call themselves Christians. But Jesus didn't tell the people to call themselves Christians. And Moses didn't tell the people to call themselves Mosaians. And David didn't say call themselves Davidians. And Abraham didn't tell the people to call themselves Abrahamians. And Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, did not tell the people to call themselves Mohammedans. No, they said, call yourselves after God. That means what? God conscious people, servants of God. That's what all of them were and that's what we are. So we don't worship Jesus Christ because he never said that I'm God, worship me. Every prophet and messenger of Almighty God brought the very same and fundamental message, worship Almighty God and be sincere towards him. If we can examine this message of each of those well-known prophets, we would conclude this fact. Where there is a conflict, it is a result of false assertions, fabrication, exaggeration, blasphemy, paganism, idolatry by the alleged writers, historians, scholars, and individuals. For instance, let me point out something to you that may be a bit interesting to you. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who were they? Matthew who? Mark who? Luke who? And John who? What were their last names? When did they write? Did they know Jesus Christ? Did they walk with Jesus Christ? Did they eat with Jesus Christ? Did they talk with Jesus Christ? Did they even meet Jesus Christ? The answer is no, 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 no. Conclusively. The earliest of them that wrote wrote 40 years after Jesus Christ, so they never met him. The last of them wrote 80 years after Jesus Christ, never met him. The other thing is, all of them seem to have written the gospel according to, according to, according to, according to. Now, when you write a letter, do you sign it according to? According to is the third party. If Joanne or Jackie or Bobby or Johnny told me something and I wrote it, I would say, according to Joanne, Jackie, Bobby, or Ronnie, according to. But those four people would not write a letter and in front of it say, Jackie, according to Jackie, and not even write her last name. Because if Jackie wrote me a check and only said Jackie, I couldn't cash it. And if I was a policeman and I stopped Jackie on the road and she had a license that only said Jackie, she's going to jail. <laughs> Where in the world is a document with only one name of four different writers that did not meet the one whom they're writing about? Where is that accepted in the whole world? Nowhere except in the Bible. And the church fathers and the church writers and the Christian historians, they all agree that perhaps those four writers themselves were only pen names. Because a writer would not write his only, his first name according to. And there's a great amount of suspicion that the man called Paul, Saul of Tarsus, that because he wrote all the books from Acts all the way to the end of the New Testament, how many books is that? How many? 16, 15, 17, 19? All the books of Acts on Colossians, Ephesians, Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, all of those books are written by whom? Paul. 
Saul of Tarsus, another man who never walked, who never talked, who never met, who never ate, who never prayed, who never knew Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Now here we find four writers and another one between them that wrote all the New Testament books that never talked, never walked, never ate, never prayed, never met the man called Jesus Christ. Yet, in their words, the first mentioning of the Trinity came from where? From Jesus or from them? The first mentioning of Jesus being divine, a man God, came from whom? From them. The first mentioning that Jesus is the Son of God came from whom? From them. Jesus never said in his own words any such words, but it was the men who never met him, who claimed to have written, who didn't know their last names. And Paul, by the way, before he had that vision on the road to Damascus that only he saw and only he heard, Guess what his occupation was? Do you know? He was a bounty hunter, a hunter of Christians, hunting them down like animals, binding them and bringing them to where? To Rome so that they could be executed. Now if Hitler, after killing thousands of Jews, said that on the road to Berlin, he had a vision that he was named an apostle to the Jews, and he wrote 20 books that all the Jews are supposed to follow. Do you think they would be following that book? I don't understand how people just don't read history. This is not what Khalid said, so don't get angry with me. This is your own scripture. Your own Bible scholars, the own church fathers, all of them agree that Paul never met Jesus, that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John never met Jesus. By the way, they were not disciples. Nor were they walkers and talkers of the disciples. They were just writers and historians. My brothers and sisters and my respected guests, I have kept you here this evening, and I appreciate your indulgence. And I promise you that I will keep you here only another 15 minutes. Will that be okay? I said these things concerning Jesus Christ because we want to clear Jesus Christ's name. We want to establish that we have a love and a respect for Jesus Christ. We have a love and a respect for the message of Jesus Christ. But we also want to make it clear that Jesus Christ's life took us towards a certain direction. It pointed us in the world to a certain direction. It is our conviction that the life of Jesus Christ pointed us in the direction of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the purpose of life? Why is it that when we ask the simple question, what is the purpose of our lives? Why do we get so many different answers? It is because people haven't really thought about it. It's too frightening. Not the question itself is frightening, but what's frightening is that if we answer it clearly, it may change our lives indelibly, and we are afraid of change. And now we have discovered that every part of creation that has been discovered is inside of a drop of water. Well, the Quran already said that to us 1,500 years ago that we created everything and every single thing from water. The Quran said that. We want to talk this evening about Jesus, the son of Mary, and his 
phenomenal birth. A birth that very few human beings, whether Muslims or Christians, have any argument about. We believe, and our Quran makes it clear for us and confirms for us that Jesus Christ, in fact, he was born without the intervention of sperm. That his mother, Mary, that blessed woman, she became pregnant by the word of God. No man touched her. Eight murders or homicides are committed every 19 minutes. And two rapes are committed every seven minutes. And there are three robberies every 59 seconds. There are 257,000 children that are legally or illegally aborted. That is 257,000 children are killed in the womb by license. 21 million children are born every year out of wedlock who do not know their mothers and fathers or who do not know whom they are fathered by. 2.8 million suicides every year of human beings who find no reason to live. With these kinds of social problems inside of their own boundaries, inside of their own governments, in their own institutions, how can they bring peace to the world? It doesn't make sense. O oh, Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds you and me that whatever good happens, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if something else happens, this is from our own hands. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has ordered you and I to enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And when we cease to do that, we don't enjoin the right, we don't enjoin, uh, enjoin the, we don't enjoin the right, we don't forbid the wrong, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised that he will visit us a calamity from himself. So that when the calamity happens or you are punished and the musibah comes upon you and you call upon Allah, he will not answer. What do the Muslims of today expect? The character of the Muslim is the most important part of the Muslim. Not what he or she says, not only what he or she wears, not where they come from or who their mother or father is or grandfather, not the country they live in, or for that matter, if they live next to the Kaaba. This is not important at all. It is the character because the character is the actual fruit. And we can remember on the occasion when the Prophet wasallam invited his companions to make a sacrifice in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Umar ibn al-Khattab he brought half of his wealth. And he considered this to have been a major sacrifice. And he was very proud of that. But when Abu Bakr radiallahu an came, Abu Bakr, he brought all of his wealth. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Abu Bakr, what he had left for his family, what was the response of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu? He said, Allahu wa Rasuluhu. Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it was by the suggestion or the order of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Abu Bakr took back some of his wealth 
for his family. And this is why the Prophet وسلم, mentioned that there was no one from among the Muslims who displayed his loyalty to Allah and his messenger وسلم, similar to that of Abu Bakr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, yes, definitely. Who? Who is better? Who is more excellent than the one that calls towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Not just calling, not just shouting, not just arguing. But they are acting upon what they are calling. They are setting a precedent for what they are calling too. They have established a behavior, a paradigm, an example to what they are calling to. And they openly say, announce, I am Muslim. Where oceans and rivers meet, does the ocean take over the river? It doesn't, although the ocean might be five times, six times, eight times, ten times larger than a river. And you know, if you took two bodies of water and you put a funnel in between them, what would happen? The larger body would absorb the smaller body, wouldn't they? But in the case of the ocean and the river, it doesn't happen because Allah said he put a bazaq. So they do not overcome each other. And one of our uh, Jacques Cousteau, who passed away now, he was a marine biologist. He was able to film under the ocean where the rivers meet the ocean and the river meets the ocean and the ocean meets the river and they go back. They meet and they go back. So therefore the rivers return back to itself and the ocean returns back to itself and they do not overcome each other. How did the prophet know that? Islam has five fundamental pillars. The first of which is to bear witness that there is none to be worshipped except Almighty God, consistent with the first commandment given to Moses, consistent with the first commandment that Jesus Christ also said is the greatest of the commandments. Hear you, Israel, the Lord thy God is one, absolutely one, not the number one, not the number one that could be divided into one, two, three. Not the number one that could be multiplied, but absolutely one, having no one besides, no other God besides. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul, and thou shalt not worship anyone except the Lord thy God, nor bow down to any graven images in the heavens or the earth or the sea below. Such said Moses, and such said, confirm Jesus Christ, and such said the Quran. This is what we bear witness, and this is the first pillar of Islam, and the most important. If war erupts in Iraq, more than 3,000 missiles will be rained upon Iraq in the course of six, six hours, and more than a half a million people will be killed. Can you tell me? how the lives of a half a million people are equal to a leader, Saddam Hussein. If America was able to go into South America and pull out, what was the guy's name, General uh, Noriega. Noriega. America was selling drugs with Noriega, but then Noriega flipped on them. So they went in and took this man from his country, brought him out, and put him in jail for life in their country. So why did they don't just go into Iraq and pull out Saddam? No, they need to go into Iraq. Why? Because you'll find that in a matter of six months after the war, the prices in the oil will go down. And as we speak right now, there are 27 mega companies, mega companies who are bidding for contracts for the reconstruction of Iraq. What does it have to do with Saddam Hussein and democracy? If a man had to get pregnant and have a baby, he would die. 
And then on top of that, if he had to look forward to taking care of that child for the next 10, 15, 20 years, and sometimes the mother, she's taking care of a grown child. Men who still live with their mothers, you couldn't do it. And still she's taking care of herself and she's taking care of her husband. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward those sisters. And may Allah cover their faults. And may Allah cause the husbands and brothers and sons to appreciate them because they are the goodly trees that bear the goodly fruit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he made brotherhood very sacred, very important. It's the whole basis of the Muslim society, brotherhood. And when there's no brotherhood, believe it, there is no substance among the Muslims. No substance. The first principle and characteristics of da'wah is that the da'i has to have knowledge. Not just ambition, not just emotional drive, and not just a reaction to some insult that somebody has said, and not just a feeling to want to give dawah because you know it's an obligation. All of those things are good, and it's all necessary. But without knowledge, what are you going to do? But always show your composure and your willingness to talk to anybody. Because why? You put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the very beginning. The messenger of Allah said, Allah, he didn't have all the answers. But he put his trust upon Allah. Allah says to him, فَتَوَكَّلُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ القائد أعلى المسدد نبينا الهادي محمد في روحه عزم عظيم في الهمة الكبرى تجسد يغشى الوضع من غير خوف One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, to lead Words, Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims. It is our conviction that the life of Jesus Christ pointed us in the direction of Muhammad The message of Jesus Christ pointed us towards the Quran. The life of Jesus Christ pointed us towards Islam. And this is why we want to say to you and say to the world that whoever is a lover of Jesus Christ, at least they deserve, they owe it to themselves at least Look into the life of Muhammad. Go to the encyclopedia. Go to the computer and punch in the name Muhammad Ibn Abdullah. Peace and blessings be upon him. If you dare. Just punch it in. 
and see what those who are not Muslim said about Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Well, I'll tell you, the five foremost premier biographers of this age, not a previous age, this age, the 21st century, the five premier biographers of this age, authorities said, when they examined and they put forward the proposition, who are the 100 great greatest human beings that impacted humanity throughout the history? That means selecting 100 human beings who impacted the most profound upon humanity. What do you think they found? Or whom do you think they selected? Now these five biographers, they were not Muslims. But three of them conclusively said, it has to be Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Michael H. Hart is one of them. He has a book called The 100 Greatest Human Beings. And his selection was whom? Muhammad. Peace and blessings be upon him. And he admitted, I tried very hard because of being a Christian, I tried very hard to put Jesus there. But when I looked at the criteria categorically, Jesus was not a father. Jesus was not a husband. Jesus was not a ruler. Jesus Christ was not a statesman. And his message was not memorized in his own life. Therefore, his religion never came to be a government. So looking at the criteria, he said, the only one I could select was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so he did. I say to you, go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, go to the computer, read the book of Michael J. Hart, read the works and the sayings of many non-Muslims before you hear it from a Muslim. You owe it to yourself to look into the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. Almighty God said about him, وَمَا أَرْسَرْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ O oh, Muhammad, you are sent to the whole world as a mercy. No other prophet was sent to the whole world, they were sent to their own people. I say to you, brothers and sisters, and our guests, you, you owe it to yourself. Punch in the name Quran, Q-U-R-A-N, punch it in, and see if you can compare, see if you can find a scripture, see if you can find a writing, see if you can find a document that compares with the Quran. You will not. Even the Bible, the gospel that Jesus Christ recited, he didn't have it underneath his arms. He wasn't walking around with a book. And nobody memorized what he brought and when he left. There were pieces of it, different people had. But the Quran was revealed in the life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, over 23 years. And guess what? While he was living, he transferred it in its entirety to his followers. And they transferred it to their children and other generations so that here in this room and in every other gathering of Muslims, there's at least one or two or three or four, maybe 10 people who have memorized the 6,626 verses of the Quran in its entirety. It has been preserved since that time. I ask you, if all the Bibles in the world, all the Bibles in the world were thrown in the ocean who would produce the Bible again? Nobody could, because they don't even agree about what the Bible is now. But if all the Qurans were thrown into the ocean right now, all of them, we could produce the Quran all over again. We could bring a Chinese Hafiz, memorizer of the Quran, a Russian memorizer of the Quran, an American memorizer of the Quran, a German memorizer of the Quran, who didn't even know each other. They would all come here together and in two days, they could all recite simultaneously and the Quran is back again. You owe it to yourself to read this powerful scripture. Don't ignore it. You cannot afford to ignore it. Either it's profound, either it's from God, either it is comprehensive, either it is as I say it is, or it is not. At least you should investigate it.
Why should you be blind to something that might have that kind of impact on your life and the life of others? After all, this is not the legislation of Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. It is the legislation of whom? Almighty God. Dear brothers and sisters, finally, I suppose I told you that this book had been universally preserved without the slightest alteration of any kind in 15 centuries. If all of this is true, what I'm, uh, 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 if all of this is true, what I'm saying, you have to agree that this book is quite profound and unique to say the least. You would be honest if you were to say that that it has to be a very profound book. Many other non-Muslims came to that conclusion, although they didn't follow it and they didn't benefit from it. Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, Napoleon Bonaparte, Bonaparte, Winston Churchill, many of them, and even Bill Clinton. He said the Quran is a great book, but obviously he didn't benefit from the morals of it. Now, brothers and sisters, you know, after you leave here tonight, you're going somewhere. I mean, tonight, you're going somewhere after here. And after you live the decreed life that has been laid out and mandated for you, you are also going somewhere after here, after here after because after all it's about after here after <laughs> you say when we say now it is what then there is no present there's no such thing as the moment it's gone And you need to think about this drama and this issue carefully. Because when death comes, it doesn't send a postcard. When you get the warrant from God, it's called death. And it comes quickly and swiftly. And you're going to answer for the gift that you have been given. And this is what we're all talking about. The gift that you have been given. This life that you have been given. It's a responsibility. Now, if you came here and you didn't know, well, you know now. You see? You know now. If you didn't know before, now you know. So that means now you are responsible. You can't lie. Our job was simply to put the proposition in front of you. And to be Muslim, it doesn't mean you have to come somewhere where the Muslims gather and dive in a pool. You don't have to go and buy some material and wrap your head in a bandana. If you're a woman, you don't have to go someplace and buy some black clothing. Although there is some significance to the way the Muslim women dress, and there's a significance to men who choose to wrap their heads, and yes, we do wash before our prayers, but it's not the rituals. This is not the issue. Everything starts with a declaration. If you came to this country from another country to become a citizen, what did you have to do? Did you have to make a declaration? Yes. When you get off the plane coming from one country to another, what do you have to do? You have to make a declaration. Before you get your PhD, you have to do what? Write a thesis. Everything in this world that allows a person to graduate or to pass on and to be accepted calls for what? 
a declaration. So I'm asking you, as a human being, I'm not trying to convert anybody. I'm not asking you to do anything that you wouldn't do anyway. But I'm proposing to you as a human being that you say inside of yourself that there's none to be worshipped, none to be acknowledged except the creator of the heavens and the earth. I'm asking you to say that inside yourself first. Just like saying your own name inside yourself. The difference between making that declaration and saying your name, you've been accustomed to saying that all your life. So if I said, excuse me, what's your name? Huh? Pam. Pam. See? If she didn't tell me her name and I just happened to know it, I said, Pam, she would look directly at me and stand up. Because that's the psychological reaction. When you hear your name, what do you do? You respond. Well, inside of you, there is a natural reaction towards God unless that natural reaction has been covered or disfigured then when God calls you you don't act and you don't respond and that's tragedy I am proposing to you who are non-Muslims to declare that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God you can determine for yourself later on if you want to be a Muslim formally if you want to accept that Muhammad is the message of God, formally, you can determine that for yourself. But minimally, raise your hands if you accept that there's none to be worshipped except Almighty God. <coughs> Muslims, put your hands down. <laughs> Those who are non-Muslims, I asked you for the proposition to bear witness that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, to acknowledge that there's only one Creator that is your Lord and my Lord. I ask you to raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, those people who were courageous enough to listen through all of this and also to acknowledge the basic proposition that there's none to be worshipped except the Creator, you should understand that there are pillars to every building, a foundation to every building, and that Islam also have its pillars and its foundation. You can be provided with all the information that you need, free of charge. You can get a copy of this lecture free of charge, those who have the courage inside of themselves to proclaim that there's nothing to be worshipped except the Almighty. You can get a copy of this lecture free of charge to examine it further. Secondly, you can receive information, literature, free of charge from the many Islamic organizations, bookstores here in Sydney. You can get one of my cards Contact me by the email and we'll send to you free of charge an illustrated guide on Islam. We'll send that to you free of charge. You can visit one of the many Islamic centers in Sydney and I promise you, you will not be taken hostage. <laughs> I advise that you sit down with a Muslim and let them explain a little further to you the prescription of Islam. Take the next step. That is, wash your hands like Jesus did. Wash your feet like Jesus did. And stand before the altar of God. Not a wooden altar. The altar of God is wherever you are. Remove all the images and all your preconditioning after washing yourselves as has been prescribed and then learn how to worship as Jesus Christ worshipped, as all the prophets worshipped. Because this, again, we're coming back to the origin of our statement. What have we been created for? What is the purpose of life? To do what? 
to acknowledge Almighty God and to worship Almighty God and to obey Almighty God. I want to thank you. I want to thank Almighty God and I ask him to guide us and to help us and to appreciate the honor of being able to make this presentation to, to, to you tonight. I want to thank the organizers of this gathering. I want to thank all the people that wasn't able to sit down here tonight. Uh, I really feel, I really feel a bit disappointed that three or four hundred people came and they couldn't come in because of the restrictions of the hall, but we had no way of knowing. Honestly, I'll be very frank with you, I don't anticipate 5, 10, 15, 20, or 50 people. I don't know. I leave it up to the organizers. I lecture all over the world. I've been to 37 countries in the last five, six, or seven years. And sometimes I lecture to 15 people, 20 people, sometimes 1,000 people. And I'm not, I don't have any particular credentials for what I do. It's a mandate from God to share whatever it is that I do. I'm a new Muslim. I didn't say I was a young Muslim. I'm a new Muslim, meaning that Islam was new to me when I accepted it. My father and my mother and my grandparents, they were not Muslims. I was born into Christianity. And in many ways, I still feel obligated. And maybe I'm suited. And maybe I can say that I compete with the Christians in my love and attachment to Jesus Christ and his message. But God guides whom he pleases. And I am grateful that God guided me to Islam. And all praise is due to the creator who guides whom he wills and who guided me to Islam. And without his guidance, I could never have been guided. I want to thank you, the Muslims. I want to thank you also for your support and any non-Muslims that you brought here and certainly any non-Muslim that you brought here tonight will be for you as an ajra. And the non-Muslims that came here, honestly, your presence here is more sacred and more important than all the Muslims combined. Because the Muslims already have the treasure. They didn't have to come. You came by your inquisitiveness. You came out of your respect. You came because you wanted to hear, you wanted to know. At least minimally, I asked the non-Muslims, when you leave from here, if you don't accept Islam, if you don't embrace Islam, if you never give the consideration to it, one thing that you would be able to do, that when somebody says that Muslims worship Muhammad, what will you tell them? That's not true. Muslims do not worship Muhammad. Muhammad was just a man and just a prophet. When they say to you that Islam is a fanatic religion, that Muslims hate Christians, what will you tell them? That's not true. And you will tell them that if some Muslims committed some crimes, if that is the case, you should not indict a global faith because of the action of a few people, just as we would not indict Jesus Christ for the actions of many so-called Christian nations and organizations for the perpetuation of slavery and war and so many things. But the issue here is not the crimes committed by Christians or the crimes committed by Muslims. The issue is that the message of Jesus Christ is pure and the message of the Prophet Muhammad and Islam is pure. And anyone who is pure in their hearts they should be able to understand that. And our proposition to you is that you consider that Islam is a system of life that has the capacity to address the issues of the world and to offer some propositions of peace, both in your life and in your family, in your society and the world. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika wa nashadu wa la ilaha ila anta wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I will only answer questions on the topic. So if you ask me about Osama bin Laden <laughs> or September the 11th or the war in Iraq, 
I won't answer it because that's not on our topic. The first question, I'm a non-Muslim atheist, but I am starting to find out that there is a God, but too scared to face it or admit it. How do I get stronger? I think that one of the th ways that you can become stronger in your conviction is to read because when you read you don't have to be afraid because you can read by yourself and your heart will never lie to you the heart is an instrument that God gave to the human being that a person continues to counsel their heart and they are sincere that means they don't lie to themselves go by yourself sit by yourself think Meditate, pray if you can, or if you don't want to call it pray, reflect. Think about the heavens and earth. Think about your life. Think about your impending death. Think about the source of creation. Think about some of the things that we spoke about tonight. And if you're willing, read the Quran. When you open up the Quran, it's not going to explode in your face. It's not going to cause you to be brainwashed. You're not going to open the Quran and find that some kind of fragrance comes out of it that just makes you intoxicated and forces you to be Muslim. No. Read the Quran. Like millions of other people just like myself did. In America, every year, more than 45,000 people accept Islam every year who used to be Christians or atheists. And last year, since September the 11th, guess what? More than 78,000 people accepted Islam. And I am one of 2.3 million Muslims in America, new Muslims, who used to be Christians or atheists or something. So I say that first of all, May Allah guide you. May Allah strengthen you. May he give you the courage to continue because at least you started your journey by admitting, one, that you might have came here thinking yourself to be an atheist, but you can't call yourself an atheist any longer because an atheist is a person that is convinced that there is no God, no religion. You're not convinced of that. You're already on your way. And we ask Allah to guide you. I don't know who brought you here, who invited you here, but it is their responsibility to provide you with the example and the information to help the seed of faith grow in your life. Um, Aki, would you give the non-Muslims here as many cards as I... These are my cards. Those are my business cards, and you will find my email there. You can either write to me or you can send an email to me and I'll see to it that you get any information that you can, that you, uh, that you need, and I will answer you any questions that you may have to the best of my ability. Where Jesus announced the coming of Muhammad, where did Jesus announce the coming of Muhammad? Peace and blessing be upon him. Well, first of all, I do not quote Bible. I say to you that in your scriptures there is such and such evidence. But I don't use the Bible as a proof because I'm not a Bible authority. But I say in your scripture there is such and such a proof. If you will read carefully in your Bible, you will find that when Jesus Christ was in the upper room in the Garden of Gethsemane, you remember that story, don't you? He was with his disciples and they asked him, Oh, Rabbi. What shall happen to us when you leave us? He said, fear not, for I will send unto you the comforter. And you will know him because when he comes, he will speak of me. 
and he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he hears from God, that shall he speak. And your hearts and your minds are not prepared, but so be it, when he the comforter comes, he will make all things plain for you. And what he receives from God, that shall remain with you forever. Now these are four prophecies that Jesus made to his disciples. What's the first one? He will speak of me. In the Quran, there's a chapter called Maryam, which means what? Mary. God revealed to Muhammad the Quran and one of the 114 chapters is named after the mother of Jesus Christ. Now is that speaking of Jesus Christ and confirming him? Yes. In that chapter, it speaks about the birth of Mary, it speaks about the birth of Jesus Christ and all of his miracles and his life and his worship and his sacrifice and God said clearly to us, neither was he crucified nor was he killed. Now don't you think that in a book that God revealed to Muhammad وسلم, if he mentioned Jesus mother Mary don't you think that God should have named one of those chapters after Muhammad's mother he didn't because that wasn't necessary it was necessary to name one chapter after Jesus' mother or Jesus because Jesus said what he will mention me he will confirm me the Quran did that second thing he said he will not speak of himself, not words from himself, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak. Brother, can you recite the ayah? <laughs> This verse of the Quran says concerning Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, that Muhammad, he does not speak from his own feeling, but whatsoever he hears from Almighty God, from revelation, inspiration, that is what he speaks. Is that what Jesus said? Thirdly, he said, your hearts and your minds are not prepared now, but how be it when he the comforter comes, that counselor comes, he will make all things plain to you. The Quran says, verily this is a book that makes all things plain and clear. Is that what Jesus said? The fourth thing, he says that whatsoever he re receives from God shall remain with you forever. The Quran has been intact as it was revealed for 1424 years since it was revealed. And that's what Jesus Christ said. The Quran states that Allah is forgiving. What is the limit of forgiveness? There is no limit. Almighty God mentioned to us in a hadith al Qudasi that his forgiveness is the greatest of all of his attributes. And also, yes, God is loving. Al Wadud, Al Wadud, the loving. Yes, God is loving. But he is also Hameen. Tanzil al Kitab min Allah al Aziz al Alim. Ghafir al Dambi wa Qabi al Tawbi Shadid al Qabi the Tawr. La ilaha illa huwa ilayhi al Masir. So Almighty God is not just loving and he is not just forgiving, but he is also swift in taking account. He's also the punisher. He's also the one that is able to hold humanity accountable. So he's not just a loving God, a relenting God, a redeeming God, a forgiving God, He's a God that also holds us accountable and will judge us and will hold us responsible for the gift that he has given us. That is also his attribute. Question. 
it is quite clear that Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him as a person, had a great impact on the world. Do you believe Islam as a religion revolutionized the world? The history is already clear. The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was a shepherd who himself was unlettered. He never went to school. He never learned to read. He was never taught to read. He was never educated. Yet this Quran was revealed in 23 years. And after the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, passed away. The whole of Arabia was under Islam, but that's nothing. There were three existing empires at the time, Rome, Persia, Abyssinia. 23 years after the Quran was revealed, Rome, Persia, Abyssinia became part of the Muslim empire. And that is nothing. For 1,000 years, the Islamic empire, the Islamic civilization ruled the whole world. 1,000 years. This came from what? A revelation that a desert Arab received, who himself was illiterate, unlearned, in the desert, that no one considered even a thought, an idea, a consideration. This itself is a phenomenon that we can only attribute to the profundance of the God's word. Islam still has the resilience and the power to reform the world. Not under the sword, but under the command of Almighty God, because Islam, as I mentioned before, is a legislation. And that's why it became and can be a world government. It is not just a book to be read like poetry. It is not just an abstract book to be written for appreciation. It's a law, it's a book of revelation, inspiration, and legislation. Having faults in the past and being a single mother, can I become a good Muslim? Certainly. And how do you start? You start by saying, La ilaha illallah. Muhammad Rasulullah. This is how you start. You start by taking the first step. Not because Muslims expect you to do it, because I guarantee you this, that if all the non-Muslims in here became Muslims tonight, formally, Khalid will not get a thousand dollars a head. No benefit will come to me for that except the benefit that God gives for guiding somebody, for opening up the treasure of Islam to somebody, for, sh for being willing to share the information with somebody. That's the reward that we're looking for. The gift is yours. And if you're feeling it, do what you have to do while you're feeling it. Because the way the world is, the world is like a roller coaster. Tomorrow, you may not feel it. Take advantage of the inspiration when it comes to you. Because sometimes in life, the way the world is, inspiration is few and far between. You know that, don't you? That person who wrote that, I hope that you will be one of the people that will meet with me when we leave from this uh, room. If Jesus was not sent to the Samaritans and the Gentiles, bearing in mind that Jesus' message was to prophesy about the Comforter, why was this so? Why wouldn't God want every tribe to know about the coming of the Comforter? Well, if you know the nature of Scripture, you'll, you'll know that God sent a prophet from among the Bani Israel. All the prophets came from a designated group of people, all the way from Moses, Abraham, all the way up. They came from a designated group of people in the beginning. But every prophet came only to a tribe, only to a specific people. This was God's way, his determination. God guided the world through a tribe, a group of people designated to be prophets until finally God sent a person, a prophet, a messenger, from also a tribe, but not to that tribe,
but to the whole world. This comforter, Jesus Christ, his specific purpose was to put in check and correct the excesses and the deviations of the banning Israel and then to announce the good news of a comforter. Now why God chose Jesus Christ to speak of that comforter? That's God's business. That is the fact. Such is the words of Jesus Christ that reflects that. And such is the words of Muhammad and the revelation that came to Muhammad Sallallahu that confirms that. What I would invite you to do is to look closely at the life of Jesus Christ, the real documented life of Jesus Christ, and the life of Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, and see how they interlock. Read the message of Jesus Christ, the real gospel of Jesus Christ, to the best of your ability. As a matter of fact, I point you to the gospel of St. Barnabas. Now, you won't find that in the popular New Testament, because that's five books that's called the Apocrypha. Apocrypha means expunged, canceled. Because at the Council of Nicaea in 354, years after Jesus Christ, the Romans at the Council of Nicaea, they decided that there were five books that they didn't want to include in the New Testament. The Gospel of Barnabas, who was the blind companion of Jesus Christ, was not included in the New Testament. But if you go to the Gospel of Barnabas, again, go to your computer and punch in the word Barnabas. And then add to it Saint Barnabas. And you'll find that his genealogy and you'll find that his history and his biography was that he was the blind companion of Jesus Christ. And his book was called the Gospel of Barnabas. There in the Gospel of Barnabas, the name of Jesus Christ, I mean the name of Muhammad is mentioned clearly and perfectly. It says, I am a mother, a non-Muslim. My son is a Muslim. I learned a lot. Thank you. Thank you also for coming. And I wish that also you would be one of the people that I get a chance to meet. As a new revert from Roman Catholic, I'd like to know if we are children of God. Well, children in the sense that God doesn't really have children. He doesn't beget. That means God doesn't become pregnant, nor does God make anyone pregnant. By his command, women become pregnant. By his command, Mary became pregnant, but God doesn't beget because begetting and being begotten is a human animalistic function. But if we say that God is the father in the sense that God is the owner, that God is the Lord, that God is the sustainer, that God is the creator, and that we are the subordinates, and if we are good servants of God, God loves us, similar to a man or a person loving their children, then in a metaphorical sense, yes, we're all children of God, but not in the physical sense, not in the literal sense. And that's the only sense that Jesus Christ could have meant. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah, God said, Isaiah is my son. And he said, Abraham is even my son, and David is my son. So by that mean, God had sons by the tons. But in a metaphorical sense. He said, didn't Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the light? Nobody goes to the Father but through me? Sure, that means that. Nobody will go out of this room but through that door, but they're not part of the building. If I said, everyone will leave out of this, door, this, this, this building by that door, and there's no other way to go through but that door, that doesn't make you part of the building. In the time of Jesus Christ, he was the truth and he was the light. And he was the way towards God. Whoever followed him, whoever obeyed him, whoever imitated him, whoever loved him would find God, but that doesn't make him God by that statement. No more, no more so than a teller that works at the bank that hands you the money is the owner of that bank. And maybe Jesus meant 
The counselor was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was Gabriel, so that wasn't the counselor. The Holy Spirit, the sacred spirit, was the one that visited all the prophets, that also visited Mary, that visited Hannah, that visited Moses and Abraham, that brought all the scriptures. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit did come to Jesus, but that wasn't Jesus. And Jesus Christ did speak on behalf of God, but that wasn't God. So the people got confused, but the Romans, they already had, the Gentiles already had a triple God. So when they read and accepted what Paul wrote, they took the triple God idea, the pagan idolatry that they were already following, and they took the name of Jesus Christ and put it with them, and they called Angel Gabriel the Spirit, and Jesus the Son, and Almighty God the Father, and there you have the Trinity. But I ask anybody that's in here, does anybody in here understand how God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, a person, a person, a person. So God is a person, Jesus is a person, the Holy Spirit is a person, a person, a person, a person, three persons, one, two, three. How does one, two, three people get to be one? Give me that mathematics. Also tell me, how do they sit? How do they judge? Do God sit on the right? God sit on the top. Do God speak first or Jesus speak first? Do God speak and Jesus contradict? Who speaks first? Who stops? Who sits? Who stands? Who was there first? It's confusing. The Catholic Encyclopedia says concerning the Trinity, it is an absolute mystery that has never been answered until now, and it remains a mystery. Those of you who are Catholics have the Father, have the Cardinals, have the Monsignors, has the Pope, has anyone ever cleared up the mystery of the Trinity? Nobody, absolutely nobody. Because it remains a mystery. And another name for mystery is confusing. It's simply not true. No one spoke of a Trinity before 354 years after Jesus Christ. That was the first time the Trinity came about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. That whole notion, it happened 354 years after Jesus Christ. So don't blame that on Jesus. Blame that on those that conspired 354 years after him. Now it's not your fault that you were born into a Catholic family and I'm not gonna say it's your family's fault. We're human beings and we're creatures of habit. And sometimes we just don't know how to stop the habit. But I'll provide you with some indelible information that will rock your socks. <laughs> Literally. If you want it now. And understand this, I have no aspersions. I cast no aspersions. I don't disrespect the Catholic Church. I don't disrespect Christians at all. Everybody is given to follow what they want to. But if you want to uncover some rocks and see what's underneath it, I'll do it for you. After all, I don't have a problem because I've been there. I'll give you a little personal story. I'm not an orphan. But my mother had nine children. And unfortunately, she was born poor in Harlem. So when I was two and a half years old, I wound up in a foster home. And between two years old, two and a half years old, until 16 years old, I was in six different foster homes. And every one of them was a different denomination. Protestant, Baptist, Episcopalian, Methodist, Methodist, and Catholic and Pentecostal. So you know I was all mixed up. <laughs> but by the grace of God, one thing that was clear, God was in my life. See? God was in my life. Different denominations, but God was in my life. So, by the grace of God, by the time I was 16 years old, I had kind of like tasted the whole buffet. 
So when I began investigating, I think I did a little bit of backtracking, a little bit of investigation. And that's why I can conclusively say to you that it's not necessarily the Christian's fault. It's your fault when you leave here. If you want to continue to plod ahead blindly and you want to ignore all the signposts, all the indications, all the propositions, all the indications that I've given to you, if you want to ignore that, you can. Or, if you're a Christian and you're sincere, I'll provide you with some more indications if you want to sit with me upstairs in that upper room. Uh, there is no um, criticism of Islam, I think this, what is this? Yeah, uh, since Islam is not governments, but why is the less freedom of religion so-called Muslim nations than in other nations? Okay, I think what the person here is saying that this is no uh, criticism of Islam itself, since Islam is not governments, you're right. But why is there less freedom of religion in so-called Muslim well, see, look, I'm glad you said so-called Muslim. Because everything rises and falls in human beings. And yes, it is true. It is pr true that in many of the nations where Muslims are, there, there is less human rights, open speech, open government. But there's a reason for that. If you study history, you'll find out that after Muslim lands were invaded, the invaders set up their own puppet governments. Then they created social conditions that became unbearable to force those Muslims out of their countries, and then they created institutions in their countries to invite those Muslims. And so the Muslims came into the Western countries to benefit from the institutions and to run away from the tyrants that were created by those who invaded their countries. Now you got to really follow the history to understand it now. So because there seems to be what you call or what is called democracy or hypocrisy, whatever you want to call it, because there appears to be freedom of this and freedom of that, I want you to examine something else. What countries have the highest rate of prostitution in the world? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest rate of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, and deaths that result from the two? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest rate of suicide? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries have the highest level of child molestation and pedophilia? The Muslim countries or the Western countries? What countries allow pornography to be blatantly put on television, billboards, subways, magazines, in the public, blatantly, Muslim countries, Western countries. So I ask you, which one of those countries would you consider to be more civilized? You have to answer that question for yourself. I've answered it. I've been to 37 countries. Now, of course, I thank God for the privilege of being an American a Muslim American, because I have the best of two worlds. But Muslim American, not American Muslim. Because by being Muslim, I'm able to avoid most of the minds in the field of America. By being Muslim, I can avoid most of the corruption and the frustration and the disparagement and the immorality and the hypocrisy and the people whose lives are empty. This is by the grace of Almighty God. So I want to say to the person who asked that very nice question that the issue of freedom 
Don't mistake the issue of oppression by Muslim leaders to be a lack of freedom in terms of the people's spiritual ambition. Still, in the Muslim world, the Adhan is called five times a day, even in the oppressor countries. Still, the people are regulated by the Quran. Still, you find that women in the Muslim countries, they're not wearing the veil and not, they're not covering themselves and they're not honoring family, and they're not honoring the, the vow of marriage. They're not doing this because they're forced to do so. I'll give you another statistic. Did you know that in the Western countries, between the UK and America, I won't count Australia, just the UK and America, did you know that 516,000 abortions are done every year? 516,000 children's lives are stamped out because people feel they made a mistake and it's been approved by the government. That doesn't happen in a Muslim country. Family, family, the word family is still a treasured word in the Muslim countries. Family has become a very abstract terminology in the West. And even male and female has become abstract in the West. Did you know that in the Western countries, uh, two women can get married and adopt children? And did you know that in the Western countries, two men can get married and, ha and adopt children? That doesn't happen in Islam. Now, we won't go into the whole issue, the morality of whether somebody was born with that disposition and whether they got the individual right, so forth and so on, but animals don't do that. <laughs> the question, the Lord's Prayer, the Lord's Prayer was teaching, was teaching, not his own prayer. That was the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer was, the people asked Jesus Christ, teach us how to pray. In case the person who's writing here, you don't know. They asked Jesus Christ, oh Rabbi, teach us how to pray. And he taught them how to pray. That's called the Lord's Prayer. Now I'm not an authority on the Bible, but this is your scripture. That's what Jesus was talking this, not somebody else talking that, Jesus. And as for Paul did not write Revelation, I didn't say he did. The books that Paul wrote are very clear. Nobody knows who wrote Revelation because John is not known himself. John who? And there are different conflicting information as to who is this John. Is it the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or is it a John of Revelation? Or is it the John who is a disciple of Jesus Christ? Well, I tell you, do your homework and you'll find out that the Bible authorities, the church itself, will tell you that the John of the four Gospels wrote 40 years after Jesus Christ that was not a disciple of Jesus Christ. That's not what I said. That's what the Bible authorities said. But I'll be available, again, in that upper room if you want to talk. A confused Christian. There appears to be difference in interpretation of Islam in many countries. Why is this? There's a, there's a confusion about Mus among Muslims about many things. Because some Muslims are knowledgeable, some Muslims are regulated, some Muslims are honest, some Muslims are decent, some Muslims are God-fearing, and some Muslims are confused, like some Christians are confused. So Muslims are just human beings. But there's no difference among Muslims about the Quran. No Muslims in the world. All Muslims know the Quran. If I arbitrarily pick this Muslim who I never met before I came to Australia, and I picked another Muslim who I never met from Indonesia, and I picked another Muslim who was from Arabia, and another Muslim from Africa, and another Muslim from Germany, and asked all of them to stand up, and I said, let us all recite from Surah Ammayat Asa'alun. I'll guarantee you, all of us would begin reciting until the end of that particular surah exactly the same, and we didn't know each other. But the Christians couldn't stand up and do that. 
arbitrarily. You want to make that test? We can make the test. Any book of the Bible, you could not stand up and recite it all together using the same words and end up the same. Because there's 354 different versions of the Bible. And all the different denominations themselves don't agree the amount of verses or the amount of chapters or where they came from. Why is there not a united gathering of leaders to address the above? Unity is up to God. God puts inspiration in the hearts of people. It's not people who make that determination. I want to know that if God had the power to keep the Quran in its original form, why wasn't God able to save the, the other holy scriptures? It wasn't intended. And I'm not God, so that's not a question for me. The, pro the point is, is that God sent a messenger and God sent a revelation and God sent a legislation that was to clarify and to be the finality of all the prophets, all the revelations, and all the laws and legal edits that were sent. So if you follow the Quran, you're following all the rev previous revelations. If you follow Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, you're following all the prophets. And if you follow Islam, you're following the deen of the system of life that's been ordered by God to all the prophets. Why is there a need to preserve it in the beginning if it was only to a group of people when he sent it in the end for the entire world? You know, you can, you can keep ducking and dodging. You can still keep trying to find some kind of fault. You can still keep trying to find and see if you can find some reason. But the Quran is clear. It needs no defense. The life of the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is profound, like the sun in the sky. It needs no defense. Islam as a system of life needs no defense. I only say to you, stop asking all these questions and simply take the test, like they say. Take the Pepsi challenge. <laughs> read the Quran with an open heart read about the life of the prophet peace and blessing be upon him with an open heart and an open mind then after that examine the system of Islam with an open heart whether you're a lawyer, a doctor, an architect whether you're poor, you're rich, you're whatever it is I guarantee you your life will never be the same why do you cover your heads? Well, I don't know. I started losing all my hair, so I said, so. No. No, uh, Muslims, Muslims cover their heads, Muslim men cover their heads out of tradition and out of respect. Not all Muslim men cover their heads, obviously, but those that do, they do so because at times, the Prophet, peace and blessed be upon him, he liked to do that. Uh, for me, I like to distinguish myself as a Muslim. And whether I'm wearing a suit and tie, which I do sometimes, or whether I'm wearing a gown like I'm wearing today, I like to cover my head because not many people cover their heads. Not many Muslim, not many men, period, cover their heads with a brimless cap. So if I'm in an airport, I'm always designated. You know what that means, right? I always ask the people, I always ask the people in the lounge when they say, Mr. Yassin, um, you've been randomly selected. <laughs> I said, I know, I'm designated, right? <laughs> and I turn around to the other people in the lounge and I say to them, is there something distinct about me that I should always be designated? <laughs> and what do you think they do? They say, yes. <laughs> so, yes, Muslims, many Muslims, choose to cover their heads, just like most Muslim men following the tradition of the Prophet Sallallahu choose to grow a beard. So wearing of the beard and the covering of the head together, that kind of is like a, that's an indication that a person is a Muslim. Usually now, because it could be a Buddhist, could be a Hindu, could be a Sikh, it could be a Jewish person, but it's a different, usually a different kind of hat. So. Wearing of the beard is a tradition. 
Doesn't mean that a person cuts their beard off, they're not a Muslim, but most Muslim men, because of the tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that he told us to do, they usually grow a beard. And some of us, we like to cover our heads. Now for the Muslim ladies, that's different. The covering of their head and the wearing of loose garment and the covering of their bodies and the not showing of their attractions is a part of their uniform. God has given the Muslim ladies a specific uniform. So they would be distinguished and known as Muslim ladies. And they would not be molested. And that in the streets, when men see them just by their, the way they're dressed, they would get some kind of respect. You don't hardly hear men whistling at Muslim ladies. <laughs> so, I mean, and don't think that the Muslim ladies are any less beautiful than any other woman. It's just that they hold and cover their beauty for their husbands. It's like pearls and diamonds. If I came to your house and I asked you, can I see your diamonds? Can I see your money? Can I see your jewels? Can I have your pin number? <laughs> you wouldn't give it to me. And you wouldn't have it in front of me. Well, our women, our wives and our mothers and our daughters, they're worth more to us. They're more precious to us than our diamonds, our gold and our pin number. Uh, is the translation of English sufficiently accurate? Um, actually, no language can adequately translate the Qur'an. The Qur'an is only in Arabic. It is only in Arabic. It's the formula of the revelation itself. However, the meanings of the Qur'an can be rendered into various languages. So that's all it is, a rendering. It is not a translation. Okay, I think that, is there more questions? I'll answer two or three more. Is that okay? Maybe uh, he meant by the comforter to be the Holy Spirit. Maybe the Spirit. Maybe Jesus spoke as if Jesus also said that I am the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus didn't speak Greek. <laughs> now Jesus didn't speak Greek now. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Now what is Alpha and Omega in Aramaic? Alpha and Omega is part of the Greek language, isn't it? Isn't it? Jesus didn't speak that. This is something that somebody asserted to Jesus Christ. And this is the whole problem. You have people continuing to tagging stuff on Jesus Christ, saying something about Jesus Christ, lying on Jesus Christ, fabricating on Jesus Christ, blaspheming God, attributing things to Jesus Christ with no evidence and no proof except their own desires. Jesus didn't say this. And you're, you're reaching for straws, but you're out in the middle of the ocean. How do you explain evolution? Darwin didn't explain it well. Now here's a man, Darwin, Charles Darwin. Let's look into his life for a moment. Charles Darwin said that man evolved from monkeys. Did he say that? Okay, let's look at this here. I mean, he's gone, but let's you and I look at it now in the light of scientific exploration and fact. Do monkeys cry? Do monkeys cry? No, they don't. Monkeys do not have the intellectual capacity or emotion that they cry. Human beings do. That's just, a, that's just as much a part of their being as is their physical being. Yes, monkeys are mammals and human beings are mammals. But do monkeys calculate? Do monkeys orchestrate? Do monkeys investigate? Do monkeys earn PhDs? Do monkeys put up buildings? Do monkeys build zoos and put human beings in them? 
Finally, if man was evolved from a monkey, wouldn't he still be evolving? What have we evolved to? And if man has evolved, if monkeys have evolved into men, why are monkeys still here? Darwin's theory lived about 25 or 30 years after he died. No one still puts forward the idea of Darwin's theory of evolution. That idea is dead just like communism is dead when the Soviet Union was dismantled. And if you are still talking about evolution, then you're really a bush doctor looking for a cure for, for polio. It's over with, it's finished. And that is not even the issue. It's, that is not even the issue. The issue is if Darwin feels that the theory of evolution is what we call natural selection, then we might connect to that because God was the one that made the natural selection for us to be here. But Darwin didn't say that. The other thing is that don't put too much stock on Darwin now because you've got to look at his personal life. He was a bit confused himself. Now, I don't like to talk about the dead, but Darwin has some major problems in his personal life. <laughs> Darwin has some major <laughs> moral inconsistencies that when you look at these major moral inconsistencies along with a theory that he put or he disguised or he hoodwinked the whole world with, I think it's time to put that to, we need to put that to rest where Darwin is. Why do you say that Islam is 1,500 years old when Adam is the first human as a Muslim? I didn't say that Islam was 1,500 years old. I said that the Quran was revealed 1,424 years ago. And I said that Adam and all the prophets were Muslims. It meant that Islam, meaning peace and surrender, was the faith of all the prophets. But it wasn't named until the Quran was revealed. Al-yawma akmaltu lakum dinakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islamu dina. That verse came in the Quran, and that's when it became formally named as a system. Before that, it wasn't named as a system. If I didn't say that, I'm clarifying that now. What does Islam say about donating organs and about cloning? Uh, we Muslims, we do not donate organs. The organs that God gave to me are for me. However, some scholars said, some scholars said that if my son or my daughter was dying of some rare disease and I have two kidneys or I have two of this or whatever the case might be and I wanted to donate that to them like giving them blood, this will become permissible. But I'm not allowed to take my body which is a sacrament, my body which is sacred, my body that was given to me by God, a body that was given to me as a gift that I don't own myself, I'm not allowed to take my organs and give them to other people and to create a new industry of spare parts. <laughs> and as for cloning, they will clone what God allows them to clone, but I'll guarantee you this, God says in the Quran, that we created man from the best of moles. Nobody will create what God has created. I'll guarantee you, if they've got a nation of clones somewhere, you've got a nation of freaks. <laughs> They're going to be deformed. They're going to be dysfunctional.
There's going to be shortcomings, mix-ups, problems, complications, and there already are signs of that right now because they've got factories right now where they're doing, what is it called? Uh, robotronics. Robotronics. They are now experimenting by putting different kinds of parts inside of human beings, taking computer parts and putting them inside human beings, making them half machine and half human. And they got experiments where they got buildings out in Texas, buildings up in France, and places where they are experimenting on human beings like that. But they've already got problems and complications with that right now because man is not able to create like God. Second thing is, if they want to clone something, that's no big deal because they're making something out of something, isn't it? If they really want to do something, let them make something out of nothing. You say that Islam is a complete system, but we're in this world nowadays where Islam runs completely in its entirety. I said that Islam as a system is complete. I didn't say that the human beings have followed it comprehensively. You see, if I bake a cake, even though I'm a Muslim and a baker, if I bake a cake and don't put the yeast in it, do you think it's going to rise because I'm a Muslim? <laughs> so if the Muslims right now are not applying Islam, then they ain't got no yeast. And it's not going to work for them either. But if the Muslims apply what God set up as a system. God says in the Quran, Inna dina inda Allah al-Islam. Verily, the system in front of God that's acceptable to God is Islam, submission to his will. If men serve God the way God has ordered them to serve him, you don't think that man will get what he's supposed to get? I mean, some of us now have automobiles that have, what are those systems they got in the automobiles now? What do they call them? Navigation systems. A navigation system that you can interchange with different software that'll tell you from a satellite where you are, talk to you all the way into your driveway. A navigation system created by human beings. And you don't think that God who created the heavens and earth and created human beings is able to navigate them? Yes, whoever follows God's navigation, whoever follows God's guidance, Whoever followed God's scripture, whoever followed God's messenger, will also find God's guidance in the system of life that he has created for human beings and who is best to guide the human beings other than the one that created them. That's the last question. Uh, those who would like to meet with me, the non-Muslims, uh, I will meet in a designated room that the brothers who sponsored this uh, have set aside. Uh, the last question, I'm sorry. Oh, personal questions and answers for reverts. After the lecture, doors beside the canteen on the right-hand side. Okay, someone will direct you towards that. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you.